Oh, perfect. Let's turn this on here. If you don't right, cool. So I'm a biologist a at the cards. National Park we Service here at Santa Monica Mountains National Rec Area. A little background on myself. I've been doing large carnivore research for two decades. Um, I've been working with mountain lions in particular in three different states, three different countries, and I've been fortunate enough to work here now in the Santa Monica Mountains since 2002 when the mountain lion study started. So I'm going to give you a little background. Hopefully I'll try to move through this quickly about our mountain lion research, what we have learned in the past 14 years, and then I'm going to talk about living safely in mountain lion country and how to better protect your livestock and your animals. Um, so we know through all of our wildlife studies at the park that habitat loss and fragmentation due to urbanization can have significant impacts on wildlife movement and survival. And this is especially true in highly urbanized areas where we have large urban areas expanding into our remaining natural areas. And even next to one of the largest cities in the country, our remaining natural areas are extremely ecologically diverse and provide habitat for a variety of species, including mount lions, who also happen to be our last remaining large carnivore in the mountains. We no longer have the grizzly bear. We no longer have gray wolves, but the mount lion is hung on. You know, it really speaks to the elusive nature of them. You know, they're not called ghost cat for a reason. And, you know, they're a very special part of our mountains too. And because they are the last remaining large carnivore, a real important animal for the ecosystem. Um, and so because mountain lions require huge amounts of space, they occur at relatively low densities, and the potential for conflicts with humans makes them especially vulnerable to the effects of urbanization. So our main study area is the Santa Monica's here, south of the 101, west of the 405. Um, we're also in Griffith Park. We have a cat in the Verdugo Mountains, a few in the Santa Susanas, one up in Los Padres. So even when our study started in 2002, we knew that the Santa Monica Mountains by themselves, roughly 275 square miles, are not large enough to support a sustainable mountain lion population without connectivity to the Simi Hills, Santa Susana Mountains, and ultimately up into the Los Padres National Forest, which represents our nearest source population of lions. We know lions are doing well up there. Um, it goes hundreds of miles up to the Bay Area. So to maintain any genetic diversity in the Santa Monica's, we need to make sure our lions can move up, but more importantly, lions from up here can move down. Santa Monica's being roughly 275 square miles, we can fit at any given time, you know, two breeding males around, four to six adult females, you sprinkle in some sub-adults and kittens, at any given time, that's around 10 to 15 animals. So in 2002, we asked the following questions at the start of our study. What's lion behavior and ecology like in this urban, fragmented landscape? We're really interested in where are these cats going? Are they in your backyard? Are they in hanging out in the more natural areas? What is their diet? What are they killing and eating? Um, are they crossing roads? Are they crossing freeways? Are there any movement corridors for them? Can people and lions just get along? And over the long term, do we think mountain lions can survive in our park? So to answer these questions, we have been capturing and radio collaring, GPS radio collaring lions. And to date, we have data on 53 individuals in the whole region. Most of them are dead now, but mountain lion's lifespan will go roughly 12 years would be an old lion. Uh, but we've learned a lot about them, which I'll share with you. When we capture a mountain lion, we'll release them at that same exact site. This is what we call a workup, um, where we're taking a lot of measurements, we're, we're um, doing a general health assessment, um, we'll weigh the animal, sex the animal, of course, take uh, tissue and blood samples for disease and genetic analyses. But the main purpose is this GPS radio collar where we get very detailed information. We would not know much about lions in this area at all um, without this GPS radio collar. Um, it works with connecting to satellites, which will pinpoint where that collar is on the landscape and then send those points to the internet. On average, we have our radio collars programmed to take eight locations a day. That's, um, it's a point roughly every two hours from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. and then one daytime location at 2 p.m. We don't get real time data, by the way, either. We only see the points after the fact. Some of the collars we have out 
will only attempt to send the points twice a day. And if the animal is in a lot of thick brush or under some rocks, we might not get those points sent for a couple days. Um, so here's an example of some of the points we get. This is P27, an adult male we're following just a week in the life. Um, so we'll get a dot on a map with UTM coordinates, time and date stamp, and we can learn a lot about where they're moving. Are they crossing roads? What habitat are they preferring? Um, let me move on. So this is um, most of the GPS points from P1, our first puma. P is for puma, the first one we've captured. And when we follow an animal for a while and start plotting all of their points, if we draw a polygon around the outer edge, that's what we'll call an animal's home range. And we quickly learned with the adult male, P1, he was using most of the mountains. Here are the home ranges of our first 12 mountain lions. They weren't all collared at the same time, but it gives you an idea of home range size. Home range size for our lions is similar to lions studied in more natural areas. Males will cover roughly 175 square miles. Um, females around roughly 72 square miles. Another interesting thing to note, home ranges are pretty much all bordered by freeways and development. So here are all the animals we're currently following. 15, 13 of them have GPS radio collars. These two little cute kittens, we have VHF implants that we're tracking. Here they are on the landscape. These are not home ranges. These circles just represent the general mountain range they're in. So we're really interested in all these connections. Are lions up here moving down? Are our lions down here moving up? Um, how are these areas, how are these lions related? Um, where are they going? Um, here's an example of three of our males outside the Santa Monica's, three adult males. And you can see their home ranges are pretty much bordered by freeways and development. P22 here, roughly surviving in eight square miles. P41, 20 square miles. P38, <coughs> up top here. Here are the home ranges of, or points from, for five months, June to October 2016, of three males we are currently following in the Santa Monica's. P45 out west. He has a pretty big home range from the center Santa Monica's out to the west. P30 is a younger male, kind of eking out his territory here. P27, an adult older male right here. Here are all the GPS points for our first 22 lines. It just gives you an idea. Yeah, 65,000 points. They pretty much cover all the open space. Um, I tell people, if you see green in your backyard, you can most likely will see a mountain lion. <laughs> um, so out of all those points too, we're really interested, where are these animals on the landscape? Where are we getting these points? Are they in natural habitat? Are they in an urban area, in your backyard? Or are they on altered lands, you know, a landscaped park, um, a cemetery? So for our first 12 lions, we did some detailed analyses and looked at those points, and 98% of all those points were in natural habitat, less than 1% in urban and altered. And two-thirds of all those points in natural were greater than a kilometer from development, meaning that these animals are preferring areas away from people. But occasionally, they will end up near developed areas, and the quote-unquote urban points we do get are usually from young males, dispersing males. They don't necessarily know a suburb is there unless they walk up to it, quickly realize, and we'll see this with the data points, that it's an unnatural area, and then they'll leave. Here's an example of P8. Right at dispersal, went to the extreme eastern edge of our mountains, up into Woodland Hills to the 405. Eventually, he ran into the adult male P9 and was killed. So overall, do we think mountain lions can survive in this urban fragmented landscape? And here's some reasons why we're optimistic. Mountain lions are remaining elusive and pretty much out of sight of people. Even us researchers who follow them pretty much daily, I know where they are when I'm out there with my antenna, and we hardly ever see them. They're very elusive animals. Um, they're successfully reproducing and raising young. Um, adult survival is pretty good in the Santa Monica Mountains. And they're killing and eating their natural prey, mule deer. But there are some challenges for these cats, one of them being rat poison. So we've had three animals die directly from anticoagulant intoxication. Um, greater than 90% of lions we have tested have tested positive and have been exposed to these toxicants as well. 
We believe the likely mechanism of exposure is from the mountain lion killing and eating the coyote, which killed and ate the small mammal that ate the poison that either the homeowner or golf course or apartment complex put out. Um, we've also documented 11 mountain lions getting killed um, on roadways, pretty much every major freeway, um, two major secondary roads, Las Virginis and Canaan in our mountains. We've had a lion poached, decapitated, paws were cut off as well. Uh, but the number one leading cause of death for mountain lions in our area is from intraspecific strife. Mountain lions killing other mountain lions, which isn't that unnatural, but we think what we have going on here in the Santa Monica is, you know, it's a little bit exaggerated. Um, so we have seen that rodent development can restrict lion movements, especially for dispersing young males. And the likelihood of running into that adult male is even greater in this fragmented landscape. Um, so there's two major problems with lions not crossing freeways. So during the 14 years of our study, we've only documented one mount lion from north of the freeway crossing south into the Santa Monica Mountains. Um, besides that, every young male we have followed, um, I think it's up to 15, has been killed attempting to disperse, either getting hit on the roadway or not, leave it, not living to the age of two. Um, getting hit on the roadway or running into an adult male. There's a couple exceptions, one being P30, who is roughly around three and a half years of age now. He has survived and is still in the Santa Monica's. But there's two major problems with animals not being able to cross freeways, and the 101 in particular. Number one is it means there's no dispersal out of the Santa Monica, so that will lead to increased interactions, which we're seeing between adult males and young animals. Um, and it will also lead to females having to breed with their father, um, which we're also seeing. And even more important, it means no dispersal into the Santa Monica's. You know, there's one exception, P12, that I spoke of. And together with inbreeding, that leads to very low genetic diversity. And that's what we've been documenting. Um, we've been documenting this unexpected behavior of males killing their offspring and even a mate. Um, and we've documented five cases of father-daughter mating, this first order inbreeding. And in fact, the, our animals in the Santa Monica Mountains here have the lowest genetic diversity ever recorded outside that of the Florida panther that went nearly extinct. Um, a similar study in a fragmented landscape in the Santa Ana Mountains have um, just as low genetic diversity in other isolated population. Um, so what are we doing about it? Um, so we've been working with many, for many years with Caltrans in attempting to restore some of this landscape connectivity. And we've worked with them along the 23 freeway, 118, 126. We're currently doing work along the 405. And it's an exciting time for us now because we have partnered with many organizations in the local area as well as federal, state, and local elected officials in an effort to fund a crossing along the 101 freeway at Liberty Canyon. And this would be, ideal. this would be ideally a vegetated overpass. It would be fenced on either side um, to funnel animals in. Um, it wouldn't only benefit mountain lions, so we're always talking about the lions, but actually this would benefit pretty much all the other species as well. Um, other carnivore research we have done with bobcats and coyotes, as well as even lizards and small songbirds, freeways are a major barrier for gene flow and for movement. So we know this vegetated overpass would benefit a variety of animals. And so it's an exciting time too because the National Wildlife Federation has partnered with our friends group, the Santa Monica Mountains Fund. Um, with the Save LA Cougars campaign, you can log on there, learn a lot about it, um, to bring awareness and to raise money for this overpass. Um, so to go on to depredations, and what are mountain lions eating? So with these radio collars, we get very detailed points. And so when a mountain lion kills a deer, for example, it'll stay on that deer anywhere from three to five days. Um, they'll kill around a deer a week, on average three to four deer a month. <laughs> Um, so we'll actually hike in to a cluster of points and identify what they killed and ate. And to date, I can update this number, but we're right around 600 kill sites from 32 lions. And 88% of their diet is mule deer, followed by coyotes and raccoons. But they will also take, as you all know, livestock, and especially unprotected livestock. 
Um, so this is nothing new in our study either. From the start of our study in 2002, um, in our first lion, P1, um, we documented him taking unprotected livestock. So during the course of our work, we have had five collared lions taking livestock um, from multiple different um, properties during the course of our study. And we have successfully worked with many landowners in the area improving their husbandry practices um, through improved site design and also different hazing techniques. And so even if you don't have any livestock, it's good to know how to safely live in lion country. Um, unless you're in downtown LA, you live in mountain lion country. And so you want to landscape wisely. You don't want to attract the mountain lion's natural prey. You want to deer proof your yard or garden, um, clear dense brush, don't feed the wildlife, don't leave dog food out, make sure your garbage cans are secure. Um, you don't want to attract the prey items of a mountain lion. Um, you also want to keep your pets indoors, your dogs and cats, especially between dusk and dawn. You want to supervise your children, um, educate them about what to do if you see a lion. Um, I hope all of you know what to do in case you see a lion. Um, you don't want to run. You want to look big. Um, if a lion does approach you or acts aggressive, you want to fight back. If you have a water bottle, throw it at it. God forbid, if you were attacked, you want to fight it. Um, if you have small children, you pick them up. Um, but it's important to note, attacks on people are extremely, extremely rare. Um, also, outside lighting, motion-activated lighting um, will help keep potentially prey items away also. Um, so a little bit about lion behavior. I get a few of these questions um, that I address. I seem to be addressing often in my emails. Um, so lions preying on unprotected livestock, and David touched on this earlier, is not considered abnormal or aggressive behavior. It's a mountain lion being a mountain lion. Yeah. Um, So it's an easy meal for a lion. And these animals, too, livestock, they're, they're not built to defend themselves. Um, so we have to protect them. Um, it's also common, it's also quite common for mountain lions to kill multiple domestic animals in one night. It is very common for a mountain lion to kill five to 10 to 20 animals in one night and only feed off one. And David used the analogy of a house cat and mice. You know, you throw some yarn in front of a domestic cat, that instinct to pounce on it is similar with these mountain lions and, and pretty much all large cats. Um, if they're in a pen situation, they'll kill the one penned animal and then they'll look around and see other animals that are distressed and running and that just brings out that predatory instinct. So any lion in that situation is gonna do the same thing. Um, and there's also no evidence of a correlation between livestock kills and aggressive behavior towards humans. Um, that is not in the literature at all. If that was the case, if mountain lions all of a sudden switched their behavior to killing people, we wouldn't have lions here anymore because lions, if they attack a person, they get removed. Um, and also, killing the offending lion is not a long-term solution. So. So research indicates that removing lions, and a lot of research has been done in Washington State, by removing lions, they're actually disrupting this complex social, social structure. And they've actually found that an increase in cougar harvest equals an increase in complaints and depredations. So you're removing usually that adult male from the area, and then you have more younger, inexperienced males in that area that are also gonna cause more conflict. <laughs> So the best thing you can do is protect your animals. And the best protection, the best protection is to build a full enclosure. And the Mountain Lion Foundation who was here um, helped us build one just earlier today. Um, this one that we built that you can visit out there is 10 by 10. It can hold around three to five goats or sheep. Um, but full enclosures need to be have four walls, a sturdy roof, um, and it's the best thing you can do to protect your animals. And so also improving existing structures is another thing. So a lot of properties, you might have already stuff laying around that you can just improve and bring your animals in. 
Here's a ranch in Malibu that had four goats. Two of them were killed by a lion. Um, the homeowner did not want to seek a depredation permit and she wanted to change her husbandry practices. So she actually worked with us. And you can see she already had in this horse corral, in the pipe corral, just extended some horse panels and chicken wire up to the roof, brought her two remaining goats in at night. Um, you want to make sure you're filling in all the gaps so animals can't get in there. Um, if you have many animals and you can't build a full enclosure, um, another great thing to use are these Anatolian guard dogs. And we've had, we've had folks in the mountains use them. Um, there's a ranch early on in our study where P1 killed many goats. Um, and the landowner was willing to work with us and actually the Mount Lion Foundation. They built a full enclosure for some of their animals, but they had a ton of goats. So they got these Anatolian guard dogs that live with the goats, they protect them. Um, and it was great because we saw data points from P1, the animal that was doing the killing, circling the pen, the full enclosure, also through tracks we saw this, um, and also circling the pen with the dogs and eliminating any future depredations from that area. So these dogs are great. Not rocket science. Um, and so also I get asked a lot about fencing and what you can do, what type of fences are appropriate. Um, it's a little tricky here within the coastal zone on what you can build, um, but basically fences will be pretty expensive, but they have to be large. Um, they must be very tall, um, at least 12 feet with a two feet on overhang, two feet underground to prevent digging, and they have to be well constructed. Um, there's also other devices, frightening devices you can try out. This critter getter I'm dying to try out. It's, you can log online and they actually tested it out on polar bears and they set up two tents, one without a critter getter and another with it. And how it works is it's heat and motion activated. So once an animal walks in front, a bunch of sirens go off, strobe lights, and the polar bear went to the one tent and just smashed it. And then it went to the one with the critter getter and was totally spooked away and ran. Um, the effectiveness of these deterrents is unknown, but it's another arsenal to have, you know, another tool in your toolbox to put out there and try. Um, there's these electronic watchdogs that will bark like a dog, you know, when something walks by. Um, the Scarecrow, a, a motion sensing um, sprinkler system that'll help keep deer away and other prey items. Um, there's also cellular cameras that you can put out on your property. When an animal walks by, it'll actually ring your phone and you can see that animal. If it's a lion or a coyote you don't want in the air, you can then make some noise and chase it away. Um, so, in conclusion, across the 14 years and 53 lions we have followed here, there's been no aggressive behavior towards people, which is a great thing. And in the Santa Monica's where we have millions of people recreating every year, um, these mountain lions are still preferring areas of natural habitat and avoiding people. Um, it doesn't mean there will never be an attack, we cannot predict that. Uh, mountain lions do deserve a healthy respect. They are wild, unpredictable animals, but clearly they don't look at us as prey. Um, and overall, lion persistence in this park is possible if sufficient habitat with connectivity is available. These human-caused mort mortality sources can be reduced, and also if um, lion-human conflict remains minimal, we'll have lions here in the future. And. Um, I always end with my token kitten slide. Um, and that's actually P46 and P47, who we're currently following. We marked them last Christmas. Um, they're roughly a year old now. Um, their mother is P19, their father is P45. And this is his first litter that we have followed. And that is all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I know he was, Jeff was dying to t show you that presentation because he's been working on it for a few hours. So thank you for letting him get through that. Um, Lynn Collins from Mountain Lion Foundation would like to have one more um, chance to come speak to us. Um, and she helped us with this great pen out here too. So hold on for a minute.